Hello and welcome to the MG EVs podcast streaming live today, Monday the 15th of November 2021. We're here to talk to you about all MG vehicles, but hopefully tonight we'll be speaking mainly about the new ZS. Uh, and we're hoping to inform and entertain you for about the next hour or so. I'm Dave Stewart, username Dave S on the forum. And joining us this week uh, from Oxfordshire, Matthew Todd. Afternoon. Fudge Bunny on the yeah. Fudge. On the... Yes, I Fudge on the forums, yeah. Perfect. From Crawley, we've got Steve Green. If you know, uh, Steve is Green on the forum. Brilliant. And again, another welcome guest from Norway, Patrick Breitenstein. Patrick, good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you too, guys. Great. And as ever, from North Yorkshire, the Innovations Development Manager at Charlie Group, Miles Roberts. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Miles McKillot out on the forum. Great. Um, if you're watching live, thank you for joining us and please click on the like button and join in in any of the discussions in the chat window, please. Uh, if you're watching live, thank you for choosing to watch the video. Uh, uh, if you're watching us later, sorry, uh, thanks for tuning in to, to watch the video and please subscribe and get any notifications, please uh, uh, to join us the next time. In tonight's podcast, we're going to reflect on uh, the last podcast, which was uh, looking at the, the new ZS uh, relaunch. And we've got now got more information. So we've got a double phased attack here uh, because we've also got Pat, who has previously driven it. And Miles, you've now clapped eyes on the car as well, haven't you? Yeah, so I was able to go to the uh, UK press launch on Thursday this last week uh, down in London, which was great because I've not been on a press launch before and it's quite nice being sort of wined and dined or, well, sushi and coffee at least. Um, but the um, it, was, it was good. It was good to go down there to, to London, drive the car. Um, we had the car for about four hours, um, which gave us enough time to get out of London, uh, drive around the Chilterns a bit and then uh, managed to uh, see what the actual car was like out on motorways and A-roads and everything else. So it was a decent drive. Uh, in total, we drove 83 miles, um, which was... Um, we probably could have driven a bit further had we not been stopped to record and film and take photos and that sort of thing, which unfortunately we have to do because we're doing a review. Um, so uh, first of all, we had an um, overview of where MG is today from... Um, the product and planning team at MG, uh, and they were just giving us some statistics such as uh, 25,290 cars sold to, uh, to the end of October by MG UK, uh, which actually places them at 18th uh, position in the UK in terms of total sales, and that's ahead of Renault, um, Honda, uh, Suzuki, etc. So they're actually selling quite good volumes now in the UK. Um, and the total mix of battery electric vehicles to normal uh, ICE engines is 34.2%, uh, which is the highest mix of any car manufacturer that does also sell uh, petrol engines. So obviously Tesla, Polestar and Smart only sell electric vehicles, they are 100% battery electric. Um, but uh, in the UK, um, I say they're currently 34.2% battery electric or, or MG. Uh, which is, yeah, say it's 3.3% it's of the total EV market uh, in the UK. So it's within the top 10 of UK EV sales um, for the uh, MG ZS EV. The MG5, I think, is actually at position 8, 11th currently. Um, so it's generally sort of like a positive you know, story about MG in terms of how their sales are going in the UK. Um, how they have plans for the brand to become stronger as well and to increase their market share, um, which obviously is all helped by them launching more electric vehicles and updating the current ones so that, you know, there's more choice out there for people and, you know, makes it a more competitive car in the marketplace against, against uh, the other manufacturers. So, um, again, they, they recapped over the, the details, not only over every spec change thing that, because we've sort of done that already, but... Uh, just to clarify a couple of details. Um, so all models, including the SE, uh, the Trophy and the Trophy Connect, get over the air updates. 
Um, so you get software updates delivered uh, via the sim that's built in. All models get iSmart, which is the app which allows you to control things like preheating and cooling and so on. Um, all vehicles get a 500 kilo tow capacity with a 50 kilo um, ball weight. Um, and da, 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 what else to say? Um, yeah, so, uh, and then there's the dual, dual battery uh, options. The, obviously the long range is what we've tested and that's what's been announced so far. Um, early 2022 is when they're going to announce the pricing for the 51 kilowatt hour version. The, the, we're trying to weigh up at the moment as to actually how many people are going to choose that? Because typically with EVs, everyone goes, I want the big battery. And certainly what we've seen on, um, in the case of Kia and Hyundai, when there is a 39 kilowatt hour battery option, for example, versus 64 on the, um, on the Nero or on the Kona, is that um, the only reason they reintroduced it was to try and get under the 35,000 uh, pound grant limit in the UK, because really it wasn't selling in any volumes um, being like two and a half thousand pounds cheaper, people were willing to pay the extra to get the extra range. But bringing it to the UK, what sort of price that's going to be? I suspect it's going to be probably again about sort of two and a half, three thousand pounds cheaper than the than the long range version. And I suppose if you're just using it for an urban journey, then it might be fine. But I suspect most people will go for the, the longer seventy two kilowatt hour, giving two hundred and seventy three miles. Um, at the moment, uh, MG said that the order take was very, very positive, that they'd had an awful lot of pre-orders. And uh, at the moment, if you were to order a car, you're probably looking at about four to five months lead time. So probably looking about March next year for delivery, which is in line with what we've been told really, you know, recently as well. Um, one of the interesting things is that um, the both models, of the, both the standard range and the long range, both use the same Generation two electric motor. Um, the generation two electric motor has got a smoother power delivery, they claim. Uh, they say it's more efficient also. Uh, it uses tighter windings on the uh, on the coil, so it apparently gets better efficiency that way. Um, but uh, due to the way that electric power is measured, um, the actual uh, power of the motor on the long range is 115 kilowatts, which is 156 brake horsepower. The standard range has got exactly the same motor, but it's got a different voltage of battery. And so it actually ends up with 130 kilowatt peak uh, rather than 115. So it's exactly the same motor. It's just that it's got a higher voltage coming in from the battery. And that's what's uh, changing that. Um, so yeah, so in terms of the car, drives great. Um, I really like it. The, the spec change is nice. It feels, um, and Patrick, I see you nodding. It's, it's, it feels very nice inside as the car. It's all the touch things on the dashboard, you know, they got they got rid of the hard plastic along the top of the dashboard. That's now padded. Um, the LED lights, obviously, we just tasted the car in the daytime. We didn't try it at nighttime, but LED headlamps as opposed to halogen project, projector headlamps. Um, updated rear lights with LEDs. Um, the boot opening, uh, the trunk opening is now a flat MG logo rather than a raised bumpy one. Make it slightly easier to clean, I think, if you like valeting your car. Um, the uh, 360 degree cameras all the way around um, gives a really good view. And uh, one of the things um, as well, obviously the charge flap at the front has been changed, which gives us a, uh, a better access to the charger. Um, and we've got that visual indicator next to it as well. Four levels showing, you know, 25%, 50%, 75% and 100% charge. Um, and those two, so the two flaps there, you have to open the top part to be able to open the CCS. Um, when you close the uh, Type 2, it closes the CCS with it because they're overlapped slightly. Um, but yeah, no, so it's it's a nice upgrade to that. Some people have complained about it not being dead centre. Um, I think that's because the MG logo has the, in the centre now, has the camera underneath it. So to make the call that swing out would have added complexity and cost. So putting it offset is not a bad idea. Um, and of course, there's the new colours that that um, Battersea blue that you can see on the photos there um, is uh, I actually quite like it in real life. So when I first saw it um, a couple of months ago at a dealer conference, it was indoor under fluorescent lighting. 
and it, I wasn't 100% sold on the, on the, on the colour, but actually having driven it for a few hours and, and, you know, spent a lot of time walking around the car as well, I actually really like the, the new front end with the, the grillless grill, the sort of stippled effect, um, and that blue, I actually really, really embrace it as a colour. Now, I haven't seen the other colours on that car because all of the press demonstrators were all Battersea blue. So I haven't seen what the silver looks. I haven't seen what the black light looks like to compare to compare it against it. But um, the yeah, the blue looks very good. Yeah. Um, the other thing that they were quite keen to show us actually, and I don't know if um, Stuart can bring this up for us, was um, in terms of the cost of ownership. One thing that MG's tried to do. So obviously the price has been increased on the retail because they've added this bigger battery is that they spoke to um, all of the uh, residual value setters and managed to um, encourage them because of the uh, better residuals that MG is seeing now, because it's a more established brand, because it's because people are, you know, have sold, well, they've sold over 11,000 ZSEV since launch. So because of this, they're now able to go, you know what, we've got a good idea of where the market is and, you know, how the residuals are going to play out. So in three or four years, what's going to happen. So um, they gave us some examples. We've put them on screen now. Um, hopefully I'm allowed to share these. Um, the, um, the ZSEV, you'll see there. So uh, on this screen here, we've got um, a little red triangle, which indicates the range of the vehicle. So we've got um, the MGZS SE, that's uh, the entry level, 72 kilowatt hour, versus the Peugeot E2008, which is a 50 kilowatt hour battery. The Vauxhall Mocha E, which is again a 50 kilowatt hour battery. Uh, the Hyundai Kona 39 kilowatt hour um, SE Connect and the Kia E Nero 2 long range, the 64 kilowatt hour battery, but um, the entry level spec on that. And when you compare all those prices, you see that uh, this cost is basically, it's uh, assuming a, a PCP finance. Uh, so the total cost of the contract over four years with a 4,000 pounds deposit, um, because loads of people have got equity in their cars now because the used price has gone mental. Um, all of the monthly payments, and it also includes in that cost uh, any deposit contribution from the manufacturer. So in MG's case, they're giving £1,500 deposit contribution on finance. Effectively, that's paid for by the manufacturer, not by the customer. So if you look at the total, and I don't know if you can see it on the screen there, the total in the middle is £15,494 over your four years. You can actually take fifteen hundred pounds off that because that's payable by MG, not by the customer themselves. So that's all of the um, interest charges and everything in there as well. So you see that MG is not only the cheapest contract, but it's also got the second highest range, second only to the E Nero. There, the E Nero costing near enough five thousand pounds more over the over the over the four year term. So. Um, you know, when people are saying, "Oh, well, you know, the the cost of the car is getting up towards." you know, a lot of the competition. Well, actually, when you look at the competition there, the range of the, I mean, I've only got experience, I haven't driven the E2008, but I've driven the Mockery. And I think that 201 miles for the Mockery is a generous WLTP mileage. I've, I've not seen 200 miles when I've been driving a Mockery. I've seen 160, but I've not been able to get towards 200. So I think that whereas um, the ZS EV, that I drove, drove for 83 miles and um, we used 28% of the battery, which would actually calculate out as 290 miles. So um, I think that the range can really hold up on the MG. I think, you know, you can really sort of be fairly confident. Now, it was a sunny day. Uh, it was 12 degrees, but we didn't have the heating set to 20 degrees. There was two of us in the car with a couple of bags and we were driving along the A40, the M40 the A404, whatever it is, it goes around. And so, you know, we did quite a, a longish route and a varied route. And we also left it parked up with the lights on, with the heater on for quite a while whilst we were walking around outside doing videos and so on. So I think that, um, yeah, I think overall, I think it's, you know, the, the range holds up well. But yeah, certainly if you look at the cost of contract there, it's it's one of the cheapest on the market and certainly one of the, one of the best range. And if um, Stuart can put up the trophy by comparison, it says, uh, then hopefully you can see on that, it's actually the second cheapest contract, but again, with one of the better ranges. So we compare the trophy against. Well, well done. I was just going to say about Stuart's doing that. 
There's a couple of questions about availability, Miles. You know, folks saying, you know, yeah, it'll be available to buy March time, but when can we see it ourselves in the showrooms? Yeah, so yeah. we're hopefully going to get our all all, demo, all dealer demonstrators should arrive, hopefully, um, with dealers next week. Um, so we commencing the 22nd of November. Um, the um, actual stock will start to arrive in December, but these are very, very early orders. Um, and you met, there may only be a few handfuls of cars actually delivered in December. Um, the bulk of the cars will be coming January, February, March. Um, and I believe the biggest boat is probably March. So it depends on how soon your dealer managed to get the order in, to be fair. Um, stock's going to be fairly limited until March, is the sort of story we've been told, certainly in terms of free available stock. Um, so just going back to that trophy yeah, um, sorry, I interrupted you. cost of contract, just to show you there. So yeah, second most, sorry, second least expensive compared to the, again, the Peugeot E2008 Allure, um, but still cheaper than Mockery and significantly cheaper than, um, and again, that's been compared against a, um, E Kia E Nero 2, which is the entry level of the Kia E Nero. Um, so even the, the trophy um, version uh, with its panoramic roof and everything else that you can't get in the E Nero is still, uh, what's that, three and a half thousand pounds cheaper than the E Nero over the cost of the contract. So yeah, it's pretty damn good going. And um, yeah, so, so it, it's very cost competitive. And that's I think that's important in many ways um, because it's one thing making a, a good car, it's another thing making it affordable. Yeah. And um, Tesla's idea of what's affordable seems to be quite different from most Europeans' uh, idea of what's affordable. So I think that, um, and so, you know, the man on the street, um, I think that, you know, we'd, we'd sort of looking you know, around £10,000 or so cheaper than a, the equivalent Tesla. So it makes a big difference. Um, so, uh, so I've just seen the answer, a question come up from Jeff Carter. Do you have to toggle switch to select the 360 degree camera or do you have to use the touch screen? Um, I believe it's a touch screen thing. Pat, you can back me up on this. I'm, I'm pretty sure that the camera button is on the touch screen. It's not on the toggle switch. Yeah, if, you, if, you, if you put the car in reverse, you can toggle it. Uh, you, you get automatic, uh, automatic the 360 degree, but you, but you can also use the, the screen. So yeah, when so you go in reverse, you, you yeah. can just tap. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the for time and so what's the for time and system like? Uh, it's a massive, massive improvement. Um, we use the normally when I've driven my wife's MGs at SEV, um, I use Android Auto exclusively. I don't That's bother with the, I don't bother with the inbuilt nav um, because by the time the inbuilt nav's loaded up, I find that I've finished my journey. Um, so, <laughs> on this eight to three mile journey, we did um, well a variation of a route that they'd set in the navigation. So they'd put waypoints in and things like that, but it was all saved in the memory. So we had to quickly, you know, once we'd driven to waypoint one, we then went to the favorite, selected waypoint two and put that in and, you know, and so on. Um, and it was really fast to respond. It actually boots up very, very quickly. The navigation as well boots up very, very quickly. The mapping has got uh, 3D points of interest around London. So when you're driving down, we've, we're down near, um, King's Cross, so you can see King's Cross Station on the inbuilt map and everything is a 3D building. Um, it's actually a really good mapping system and it's actually really, really responsive now, which I would have been lying through my teeth if I'd made any claim about the previous model being anything like that. Um, this one, yeah, no, world away, much better, much faster. Um, and uh, actually, Pat, if I can refer to you on this one, because um, you've driven the car more poorly than I have now. Um, yeah. So if you want to give some feedback, please. Yeah, exactly. The, you, you talked about the navigation. What you can do as well is when you use the app, you can already program a route on the app while you're at home. And when you jump in the car and plug the you, you mobile, the, the, the navigation system picks it up so that you have, uh, you have already your, what, what you pre-programmed on your phone. You have, uh, you have it coming on the car with the uh, iSmart. So now it's a big improvement with the uh, with the system as well. And uh, as you say, the touch uh, touch uh, screen is what is 10, 10 uh, times uh, ten inch. It's quite yeah, big. Ten point one versus ten point one. Yeah, yeah. That was another question I was going to ask about. Um, but, um, does the um, does the app? What does the app do? 
well you can pre-warm the car you have uh, you can uh, lock the car you have uh, all the statues uh, battery and so on you can use it to um, to program some maps i didn't use it full uh, thought of doing a video as well but i have to get uh, get hold of one uh, one car that has uh, where i can use the app on but the app is installed uh, and uh, it's is ready to go but that's the the only thing i, I try to i managed to to see with it yeah, you I can open and close the car as well with the app. Yeah, I hope to do a video on the app features actually, but um, like Pat, when when we borrow these press cars, we can't the, we can't just set up an app and, and register it for that car because we're going to give it back in three hours and they've got another press driving it later. So, um, so yeah, so until I get my actual demonstrator in the, in the showroom, then I'll I'll do the video on all the different features. But it's it's very fully featured. It's it's the same as you would find. I mean, we had a jaguar i pace before it's got all the features of that had and more um so yeah it's it's really um a fully featured app for an electric vehicle in line with competitors um the other thing to say about the car um that was a bit different so it's got um just confirm it's got alloy wheels but they have aerodynamic covers over the wheels so they are 17 inch alloy wheels um they're a lightweight alloy um but uh, and I think I've seen this before with like Tesla Model 3 and the Hyundai Kona, is that um, if you make a lightweight wheel, um, it's difficult to make it aerodynamic because aero basically means you need to flatten the wheel as much as possible. Well, if you're going to do that with alloy, you're going to need an awful lot of metal to be able to make it flush with the outside of the tyre. So this is the way that Tesla do it on the Model 3, and it's the way that other manufacturers do it as well, is that they make a really lightweight alloy wheel, and then they fit a, a plastic trimmer at the front. And they look really good, actually. They look really convincing as wheels. Um, but it just means that you've got that aerodynamic efficiency that you wouldn't have otherwise. Um, and uh, yeah, so I th actually, I like the way they look. I find that the ride is different. Patrick, you said about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, the ride feels quite different to the original ZS. I don't know where they've made the improvement. I don't know what the spring rates have changed or whether they've changed the shock absorbers or whether it's down to the tire change, which is now uh, a 55 profile rather than a 50 profile tire. Um, I don't quite know where the improvement has happened, but I, it is improved. Yeah, that's it. That's exa exactly what I found out as well. Uh, as you said, the wheel has gone from uh, 2550 R16 to 2550 5 R16. And um, and as you see, uh, and I think the spring they, they I think they have they have changed it as well, but uh, as you say the ride was uh, definitely smoother and uh, and more enjoyable. Mm -hmm. uh, the last time we spoke to you, you had driven it two or three times. Or have you driven it again more recently? Yeah, I drove it. Uh, I had to to drove it um, la last week again because mm -hmm. I needed to uh, to see the all the new features. So I had to go around and see, uh, and as Miles said, I mean, you get a lot of car for the money as well. I mean, I'm, I started the list, I have 20 uh, improvements on, on the car and it's uh, it's not stopping. Mm -hmm. So I, there, there will be uh, more on, on that list as well. But uh, yeah. Do you want to share some of those with us or are you keeping that for your... Yeah. Well, most of, of them have been said. There is, a, as well as you said, the new seat. I mean, ABS has changed as well. It's totally, uh, it's totally new. So with the first model, when you when you are between the charge and um, the acceleration point, you hear noise with the ABS and grinding noise. This is gone. Mm -hmm. um, the BMS as well is new. That's maybe that's something as well that gives you a smoother ride. Um, the three hundred sixty camera really nice to have. Uh, what have uh, horsepower as well? One hundred and fifty six horsepower. That's uh, that's uh, as well quite uh, quite nice. The trunk capacity as well has increased. It's uh, 448 liter now with the trunk capacity. So I had to go and check myself, but uh, from the first generation to the second, the, the trunk has been a little bit bigger. Right. Um, the wireless wireless charger as well is quite uh, convenient to have. You just put your phone in charge. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have to ask Miles, do they have the tainted uh, window when you tried the car? No, because well, that's something. Yes and no. So the, the windows are now tinted slightly. So 
like every other manufacturer normally puts a, t a slight tint on the windows so that you don't have a greenhouse. This has now been done to the MGZS. So it now has a light tint um, on the windows. Now it's, it's like the front windows all around on normal cars. Okay. Yeah, so it's a, so it's it's light tint, but it does mean that you don't get the UV burn through the glass, um, and it means that if you want to, you can tint the back darker, and but you don't need to tint the front. But yeah, I'd say it's like an it's an eighty percent tint on all round, so it's only blocking twenty percent of the light. I'd say maximum. Yeah, that's an improvement in your house. Yes, well, I so said the previous one was it was yeah. like being a rotisserie chicken. So yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> It was much nicer in the new car. Um, a couple of uh, I've just seen a couple of questions come in on the thing. Um, Ian says, "Is it a heavier battery?" Yes, I think the car's increased in weight by hundred kilos. Kilo. Sorry, I think hundred kilos. Two hundred kilos. Uh, with, yeah, it's 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 eighty to hundred kilos. With, with, it's not drastically heavier. Um, I have, to, I I have my notes. Extra, you know, twenty-four kilowatt hour battery, but it's um, yeah, it's uh, slightly heavier. Um, Someone's put yeah, it's a hundred hundred kilos. Okay, the, the, the first out. generation was thousand five hundred. It's what sixteen kilo. hundred, isn't it now? Yeah, yeah, and sixteen. So uh, Adams asked, "Does it have a heat pump?" No, it doesn't. No. Um, it's uh, still a PTC heating, but to be honest, I mean, like we as we had the heating on, and that, yes, it wasn't a cold day. You know, it was twelve degrees, but we had the we had the heating set to twenty all the time um the climate control set oh that's the thing as well it's climate control rather than just a red to blue gauge now. oh good um and um we averaged four miles per kilowatt hour um over the drive which i, I think for motorway driving and, and everything else is is pretty good um so i'd say you know i think that realistically yes a heat pump might save you a very very you know 0 0.1 or, or 0 0.2 of a, a mile per kilowatt hour maybe on top of that but it's in real world driving, you know, as well, the cost of putting a heat pump on the car would maybe be an, an extra. When, what is on the Enyaq is about 650 euros on an Enyaq, I think, to get a heat pump. So if you think 650 euros, 500 pounds, that would buy an awful lot of electricity. Plus weight. Plus weight as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that heat pumps were really useful on the first generation Nissan Leaf, where you had a really small battery and it needed to eke out every single mile. Actually, with the bigger batteries, I think the biggest contributor to uh to efficiency or lack thereof is probably um the speed at which you drive you know if you do 70 miles an hour on the motorway if you do 120 kilometers an hour instead of 100 you're going to uh see a much bigger consumption that way than just having the heating running on a heat pump instead um the boot space increased boot space in impresses me and surprises me a little miles because i thought the sort of rear end of the car was pretty much the same as the first version yeah i haven't measured it myself to be honest i don't take take much now it's interesting because in the uk they haven't told us of an increase in batteries in boot space yeah. so i always wonder if it's down to the way it's been measured rather than actually you know so they, they told us it was 420 litres. Now, I haven't been out and measured it, so I can do when I get the car, but at the moment I'm working off the statistics that they say. But um, Pat, have you measured, managed to measure both cars side by side to see? Yeah, yes, I, um, I did. I mean, the, the, the first generation was 350 litres and, uh, and the second one is, I mean, is, is 440 at something. And it's, uh, it, it, I mean, on... Um, they say it's 448 liters, so it has been uh, nearly a uh, hundred liter uh, liter extra. So I don't know if they did something as well uh, with the the bottom side uh, of the of the car. Oh, with the drop, with the lower section, maybe yeah. maybe the way they measured it before was to the top level rather than the bottom. I don't know, but yeah. Um, Could one be. thing that was actually quite good when we were doing the press launch, we went to uh, Beaconsfield Services on the M40 to um, basically so I could get my microphone put on and things like that because we just drove out of. This underground car park under MG, uh, under MG's head office, through the London traffic and everything, and you know didn't have a chance to really do anything. So look, well, let's get out of London. Let's then work out how we're going to do some videoing and put the microphones on things. We stopped at Beaconsfield Services and we saw a black MG ZS EV uh, original version in the car park. So being cheeky, I went up and asked the guy if we could use it for filming to do a comparison side by side, and he said yes. That was really useful. So, um, 
yeah but the uh, the video is, is on so my video is on uh, the Chorley group um go ev uh, youtube channel if you want to go take a look at that you can do um obviously pass i'll be watching your video as well <laughs> and uh i think one of the things that i appreciate now more than i ever used to before is um i, I asked I asked for questions before I did this video. I asked people on the forum if they have any questions. I can maybe try and answer them in the video. And then when it turns out that when you're driving through central London, you've got a camera poked at you whilst you're trying to navigate traffic, you forget all the questions that you're supposed to answer and you just start talking rubbish. So um, hopefully I'm going to do another video when we get the demonstrator and I'll try and answer all those questions as well. Like Pat, you know, you need to do a sort of a second or third video just to try and answer all the queries. But um, it's. Um, yeah, so the car impressed me. I like it. Um, I'm looking forward to us having one. Um, and I think actually that the price point that they put it in at is actually very competitive. Um, and yes, it might not be as cheap on paper as the original version was, but they have massively improved it as well. So, um, I mean, Dave, I'll go back to you and maybe get some, see what other people are thinking and see what they think about the car. Yeah, definitely. Um, certainly from my point of view, again, every time you compare it to the original version, it's just tick, tick, tick. Uh, yeah, I've said on Team Times before, where I live up in the north of Scotland, Inverness, it's important for me to have the, the, the more increased range. So I'm certainly very interested in that. To be honest, all the other things are a bonus to me because uh, uh, I think the range and just how getting away with uh, the range anxiety that I sometimes suffer suffer from, uh, that would be absolutely fantastic. I think the look of the car is nice. Um, everything I hear from yourself and Pat, it just seems to be a better ride quality, seems to be better uh, passenger compartment. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to getting a chance to actually look at one in the, in the flesh. Um, can I just go back to the boot space? How does that compare with the uh, MG5 boot space wise? Because I know a lot of folk move from a ZS to an MG5 for the the the, the boot space or the the size of the car. The car. I f I find oh the same. I drive an MG5. My wife drives a ZS EV. I find that the boot space is very comparable between the two. I think that in actual facts, although the estate car you'd think would have a bigger boot. Mm -hmm. ZS is, is packaged so well that actually it, um, it is pretty much the same sort of usable space, I'd say. It's, it's, yeah. it's like a taller space rather than maybe the, the, depth, the length of it, but it's, you know, it's very, very similar. So I, I, I use the cars interchangeably. You know, we have a dog that goes in the, a crate in the back of either one and it, it fits fine in, in either. Yeah. Um, so Matt, it's a, is a ZS you drive or is it a five? I've got a five, um, and the main reason I got the five over the ZS was the length of the boot, which is right. down, so I could put longer items in. Um, and to be honest, I thought the five looked better than the old ZS. Um, but I do like the new one. I like it a lot. And listening to, listening to what Pat and Miles have said about driving it, what's your thoughts? If I could afford to change the car, I probably would. Right. Okay, that's good. And Steve, are you a you're a ZS man, aren't you? I am indeed. Yes. Um, I've I've been following it closely, and I like. I, it's pretty much a list of everything that was wrong with the with the current with the current model. And you know, they, it's like they took a complaints list and went, okay, right, do do that. And they've sorted it all out to me. That's how mm -hmm. it looks. Um, I've been following following on the pages on Facebook and seeing so many people saying, I'm changing, I'm changing, I'm changing. Mm -hmm. It's, nice. it, yeah, people are very, a lot of people in the V land are very excited about it. Well, as you probably know, Steve, uh, uh, we're claiming credit for that because we put together the Santa list on the, the <laughs> on the forum and we sent it to MG. And I think that's the only document they looked at on redesigning this. Miles, am I right? Or? Yeah, so uh, back in uh, January sure, uh, 20, I think it was, we put a list together and sent, submitted that to MG, and it was about two sides of A4. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and they came back, and some things they managed to fix with the Comfort 2 update that they did with the software, yeah. stopped all the bongs and, and that sort of thing. Um, 
and some of the you know put the permanent range display so you knew how much range you had left without pressing the having to flick to the battery mm -hmm. button. Um, so yeah, they did some things with the original car that they could, but obviously this new version has got uh, a lot of um, a lot of improvements on there, um, and I think that you know it's worth the extra money. Now, obviously, you know budgets being what they are, if you can't afford it, you can't afford it. Um, but I think that it's 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 achievable for a lot of people, and I think that one thing we've seen with people that we've spoken to so far who have previously had a ZS EV, Dave is that um, because of the residual prices of their vehicles have gone, have, have stayed so well, they're not, they're, they're able to change after a year, two years and have equity in the car, which is something that they previously wouldn't have, you know, they thought they'd have been nailed into that car for three or four years. Um, yeah. But actually the used car market being as it is at the moment. Or lose very little. You will, you will lose very little or you will, I think you certainly have some equity in there. So it's, um, a positive situation okay. for people to be in to be able to have the opportunity to, to move um just saw a camera call uh, sorry a uh, question come up on the thing does the se have the 360 degree camera um yes we were told that all models have the 360 degree camera um now if they don't when they physically come into the uk then that's a different matter but the product and planning manager matt i'm talking to you matt stevens um said that they all come with a 360 degree camera so um yes um and but in the uk we only get a seven kilowatt onboard ac charger uh the 11 kilowatt charger um is in europe yeah pat you're lucky um but over here we just don't have the um we don't have the three phase charging in a lot of places to be perfectly honest so all domestic supplies here are single phase so an 11 kilowatt charger versus a seven is a very very small chance of it actually you know, being useful for people yeah. um again we haven't had a chance to try the rapid charging capabilities patrick i don't know if anyone's done that with you not not yet but that's a plan as well but did you find the did you have the granny uh, charger as they call uh, yeah so yeah so in the uk it comes with the uh three pin granny charger mm -hmm. um and the type two is optional um although as i said a couple of weeks ago if anyone buys a MG's an SEV facelift from Trolley Group, then we will give you a Type 2 lead for free, as well as a set of mats and a £500 discount on the car. Yeah, I think, fine. that I've got the ZS exclusive, so it would be the trophy I would be looking at switching to if that was uh, the, sort of the closest comparison. So the, the, there is quite a price difference, though, isn't there, Miles, uh, when, you, when you're comparing... The SE to the trophy? Ah. Uh, yeah, you're looking at um, so the SE is a retail price, recommended retail price after the grant of twenty eight thousand five hundred, and the trophy is thirty one thousand after the grant. Um, so yes, yeah, so you're looking at uh, what's that two and a half thousand pounds increase, mm. um, and for that two and a half thousand pounds, you get um, the glass roof, um, which in some manufacturers is about nine hundred pounds optional extra. Um, you get the heated pleather seats um you get oh what else do you get uh the wireless phone charging system um i'm trying to think what else you get on the between the two cars heads mash folding oh. mirrors oh yeah folding heated mirrors yeah um this, uh, you get the rear cross traffic alert and um blind spot monitoring system as well so it's got extra radars and the bumpers for those um so yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, there's still some difference that's, that can sort of justify the price difference. I have to say, actually, I think the SE is a really um, compelling car now. Um, previously, the, the the cloth interior and the... Oh, of course, you've got roof bars as well on the trophy, which you don't get on the SE. So, yeah, if you want to be able to put a roof load on, then that's the one to go for. If you just prefer the, the look of the roof bars, then, yeah, go for the trophy. But, um, you yeah, know, I still think the SE is actually a really competent car and if you look at the um for example the kia nero 2 specification versus the the higher specs uh, the kia nero 2 is like thirty two thousand nine hundred pounds so it's still more expensive than the um top of the range zs ev facelift um and the um 
the Nero 2 has got hardly anything kit wise on it at all. You know, in terms of uh, all of them, including the SE now, have got the full MG pilot um, suite of things. It's got speed adjusting, cruise control, lane keeping assist, all that sort of stuff is on the SE as well. So, so that's good. The the dials and uh, visual controls look so much better. I don't know if uh, Stuart can put up that image again. He had it a few minutes ago of just looking at the infotainment system and uh, the speedometer and central console, etc. It just seems a lot more clearer and a lot better thought out. Yeah, and the the the, the nav screen being ten inches as well um, makes so yeah the, the display in front of the driver is bigger. Um, and more like you see in the MG5 with, again, some virtual dials around the side. Um, and there's various information you can pull up on that screen. So the screen, that, that was like my trip display that was on there. But you can, again, simplify it down to, if you're on the motorway, you can just have uh, your ACC system. And you can see the sort of, you know the other cars moving around your lane as you're driving in the middle. For example, you can see one in the slow lane. You can see one in the fast lane. Um, so it's a little bit more advanced and a bit more aware of the, the other lanes compared to the previous model where it just showed you the car in front. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, actually one thing about the, uh, somebody's asking the questions about um, battery percentages. You can now set a battery percentage uh, limit um, anywhere from 40% uh, battery uh, up to 100% in 10% increments. So you can choose, you only want to charge your battery to 50%, you can choose that. Um, likewise, you can set a discharge level for the vehicle to load system. So you can say that the battery doesn't drop below 20% or however many miles, and it'll show you a guess, like it would on a Tesla, it shows you, you know, 20% is 51 miles or whatever it is, you know. Um, so you can see on there as a, you know, an estimate of how much mileage you'd want to stay within the car. If you're um, using it, you know, for camping or something like that. Um, yeah. Now, the, the only thing we haven't got at the moment, we haven't got the price of the adapter for vehicle to load. So, the cars will all have the capability to do vehicle to load, but to physically plug something into the front, it needs an adapter. We haven't got the price yet on whether what that adapter is going to cost. I, I, I expect it to cost less than £200. I don't know how much less than £200 it will cost. Um, Patrick, have you got any information from Europe about that adapter? It'll be different plugging and everything, but... Yeah, not, not at all. Not yet. I'm uh, same. I'm waiting for the to see the price. But I'm we the... don't have anything. The ability to tow is an additional feature for this version. Would, would that have interest Steve or Matt? Is that something you would be doing? Or? Not towing, uh, not for me. It'd be a useful um, tool to have in the um, tool kit to be able to tow occasionally. Yeah. I, I've been watching some of the threads and a lot of folk are quite interested in the towing capacity. Uh, uh, was it 500 kilos, is it? Or? 500 yeah. kilos towing, yeah, with a 50 kilo nose, nose weight on it. So it means that you can put a, a tow-mounted bike carrier, for example. So, I mean, I, you know, if you've got four bikes, it's a, it's difficult to fit them all on the roof of a car anyway. But secondly, it's also a weight having to physically lift it up that height because it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's quite a tall car. So if you can hang them on a tow bar mounted carrier it makes it a lot easier to you know to lift them up you know 30 centimeters or whatever rather than having to lift them 1.8 meters so um it's uh yeah i think a lot of people are interested in the tow, the tow bar more for that sort of application probably rather than well, i suppose maybe like a small urday camping trailer or something like that you know like a little um like meter square camping trailer with a little lid on or something you know that might be useful for you can also use on the promotion the, videos they show like a little jet ski on a trailer behind the car. All right. Uh -huh. Last time trailer. I was on Miles, I asked about well, did you know if they'd put any more extra lighting inside? Um, no, they haven't. No, uh, have I changed it to LED at all? Uh, the front lights were LED, I'm sure, in the car that I had, um, but no, there was no lights in the rear, um, which is a shame. I see you, Adams, ask, ask the same question in the... In the yeah, yeah, no, there's no real lights on the car uh, internally. Um, John John Lee says a nice copy of the e-Nero. I think something we spoke about two weeks ago, they're all starting to look quite similar, but that's always happened in the, the, the history of car design. You see uh, an effective design coming in and, and it's adapted by and adopted by many other manufacturers. Yeah, I think that 
as as you put something in a wind tunnel and try and get it looking a bit more aerodynamic, you're all going to come up with a similar sort of shape within the constraints of of what the packaging is. You know, if you if it's a crossover type vehicle like this, there's only so much you can do to make it aerodynamic. You know, you're going to make the front bumper a bit smoother, some sort of stippling like a golf ball to make it perhaps uh, slightly different than the aerodynamics. But it's they're all going to look much of a muchness. Um, so it's uh, at least it doesn't get in, confused now probably with a Mazda that it did before. Um, so uh, that's the that's the only difference. But it's uh, I quite like the new, the front of this new one. I think it does stand out probably more in a way than it did before. Um, but I've come from driving all sorts of electric cars that shout about the fact that electric cars, the original Nissan Leaf, stood out a mile, and that wasn't probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, both attractive cars. Yeah, my, my youngest son used to refer to it as the one that looks like a, it's got frog eyes because it had these you know, big or bug eyes because it had the big bulge headlights. Um, Barry's asked, has the SE got LED headlamps or is it just the trophy? No, the SE also has LED headlamps. Um, so, yeah, so uh, it's pretty good. I see a few people asking about the Apple CarPlay. And, uh, and yeah, so I don't, have Apple, I don't have an Apple phone, so I can't com comment on that because I've got a a Google Pixel 4, so I can't sort of come. I haven't tried the Android, the uh, Apple CarPlay things. And I'll be honest, I only tried Android Auto for about two minutes, plugging my phone in on a cable, and then I went back to their built in navigation. So um, I haven't, uh, as far as I know, it doesn't do wireless, but I may be wrong. I haven't got an iPhone to try it with. It certainly doesn't do, it doesn't do Android Auto wirelessly anyway. Okay. It looks pretty exciting package, I would say. Just everything that they put together, everything that they've improved. Yeah, there's a bit of a price differential, but you would expect that with uh, everything they put in. I think we said two years ago, didn't we say you could have lots more in the car, but it'll cost more, and, and that seems to be the way uh, that thing, things are. One thing uh, is, one sort of snippet of information, if I can give. Um, so at the press launch, they took the press, obviously told them about the car and they also then took us to the Sake Design Studio, which is based in, in London. Uh, and it was on, we were on floor three for the presentation, then it was floor two was where the Sake Design Studio is. And these guys are the ones who um, basically try and send ideas to China to give them uh, ideas on design directions for the car interiors, for exteriors. Um, this is the team that worked on uh, the original HS and GS and the MG3. Um, and they also came up with the um, MG Cyberster concept. Mm. Um, and the more recent one you might have seen, which is the um, MG Maze concept, which was a, a model they came up with uh, in September for their um, 10th anniversary of the design studio. And um, I'm hoping, hopefully, um, we've got to have... Um, the uh, design director for the Sake Design Studio on one of our uh, interviews, hopefully in the next few weeks, oh, good. Um, like we had with Guy. So hopefully we'll be able to get him on. The um, one snippet that was interesting though was that um, Cyberster is undergoing development to make it product uh, for showroom. So it's actually um, in the pipeline. So I don't have a time scale on how soon it's going to be here, but they are <laughs> they, they got five thousand pre-orders in um, China within a week, so they are um, accelerating their plans to actually bring that to market. Um, and something else that maybe Pat could pick up on. Uh, there's a few questions about the cabin noise. Is it quieter? Has, has there more improved soundproofing? Thank you very much. That's actually what I wanted to talk about here. Yeah, this the sound insulation is. Is better, definitely better. And when, yeah. uh, already for the, from the engine, the engine bay as well, when you open it, you see that it's uh, soundproofed. But inside the cars, as Miles said, when you drive, you don't you don't hear in anything. I mean, it's silent. Really, mm -hmm. really good soundproofing. Yeah, there was uh, actually there's a photo, if you can find it, there's a photo of the bonnet up on that I took uh, when I was doing the video. So hopefully if it pulls up, you'll see there's quite a lot of big, there's a big soundproofing all underneath the inside of the, uh, bonnet and also at the back of the firewall as well as now soundproofing on the um yeah as you can see at the back of the engine bay there as well so they're soundproofed at the back and they're soundproofed um also uh, underneath the bonnet itself so yeah it makes it a lot more uh quieter 
and uh, one thing as well I say it's totally re- the 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 motor bay looks completely different to the Mark One. They've completely changed all of the components. So um, so yeah, so it's not just they've stuck a big battery and changed a bumper. This is a this is a redeveloped car completely, really. Yeah. I, sorry, I, I saw on Facebook, I'm just trying to find it now. A uh, company has designed or will be designing a frunk for it. Yes, a company in Ireland that makes um, frunk liners, doesn't it? They've done it for the yeah. Enero and, and a couple of other cars. Um, just going through Facebook now to try and see it, but mm. I think it's quite a ways down now. It's earlier in a week earlier last week i think i saw that yeah they've got to get their hands on one of these models so they can actually physically measure it up and do it but they will be doing i think they cost about 200 pounds 250 pounds something like that so they're not the cheapest thing um but if you want to add it on you can do I won't. Um, steve, steve you've opened a can of worms there because there will be a <laughs> there'll be a thread in the forum all about what about your insurance if you install a frunk and similar to the have been for led bulbs because people's having to talk about. Yeah, true. <laughs> uh, just seeing E Blues has commented, why why are there no front parking sensors? Um, I'll be honest. I've I like three hundred and sixty cameras. I think that they work really well. Um, and I found that in other cars, when I've had front parking sensors, like a Nissan Leaf, sometimes they were badly affected um, by exhaust fumes from cars in front of. I've been stuck in traffic, things like that, or. I think that the, the camera actually works better, but you know, you could uh, install aftermarket front parking sensors if you wish. But I think with a 360 view, you don't really need them. I don't think they're necessary. Um, oh, Carl has asked about the seats being changed. Yeah. This is the found the seats a little bit narrow on the original version. Pat, you've I found well, I found this personally, and Pat, you said it's, it's about an extra inch of padding, is it they used or something? Yeah, and definitely on the back, on the lower back. Mm. And on the, a little bit on the side as well, so you it feels uh, better, definitely better. Yeah. It's, it's hard it's to describe on, on the video what things feel like, isn't it? I think that we just need cars to get uh, in the showrooms, and then people can sit in themselves and, and try them out. But um, yeah, we would if you've previously previously discounted the MGs at S because you didn't find the seats comfortable, take another look at this because they are different now. Yeah, I would think the space capacity for the seat will remain pretty much the same, but the, the construction of the padding, etc., will... Yeah, uh, the five bolsters and the padding on the actual, I believe, I'm sure I've seen somewhere, or they said somewhere, that um, they're now using like an extra layer of high-density foam on the surface under the fabric, so that it was almost like a memory foam type seat that, that gives more uh, cushioning, more um, comfort. So... Um, Got people asking out there about um, the steering reach or lack of it. Yeah, now there's no reach adjustment on the uh, ZS. Um, there is on the MG5 and there is on the HS Fab. Um, I guess they've used the same steering column or a similar steering column to last time, and that's why that's not been changed. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's just the way it is. I think actually with it being a more upright vehicle than the MG5, you perhaps don't need as much reach adjustment because you sat, you're sitting forwards more, you're sitting more upright than you do in the MG5, which is more of a, a sat down reclined position. So yeah, saloon style, yeah. Yeah. So I think that maybe that's one of the reasons why, you know, in terms of um, ergonomics, they can get away without offering uh, reach and it still fits a lot of people. I see. So, Someone else was asking about the sound system. Is it upgraded at all? That's speakers. Um, I'll be honest, we didn't really try the speakers too heavily. Um, I don't think, it, I think it's probably the same speakers. Um, I don't think there's been any changes to that. Um, I, a bit of tweaking to the, um, to the VU bars and stuff, I think you can get it sounding better than if you leave it on a flat system, but um, I didn't, I didn't test the sound system particularly. Yeah. With, you know. Barry was asking whether the uh, sound system was different. He's got a, he's got a noticeable transmission whine, which sounds like his car as opposed to the ZS. So I find that there isn't... Now, again, whether this is just better insulation and whether the whine you hear is the AVAS system on the original one partially, as well as motor whine, 
I find this motor was quieter. I don't know if that's if that's the same from when you're outside the vehicle. I know it's from inside the vehicle. There seems to be less transmission type noise at low speed, but I don't know if that's due to better sound editing or whether it's about, you know the new motor design or, or what it is. I don't know. There's one asking about adjustable lumbar support. There is no adjustable lumbar support, but Pat, you thought the lumbar region was better constructed. Yes, <clears throat> yes, I, I think this, the support is, is a little bit better. As you say, with the memory form, I mean, you feel uh, you, it feels quite nice to, to sit in those seats. So right. the, you have to try it, definitely. Yeah. And uh, folk asking about a scrunching noise coming from the AVS. I mean the preload when it's doing the MG pilot, presumably. Um, I'll be honest, I didn't notice it. We did use the MG pilot system um, when we were doing the test drive. I didn't notice any of that sort of ABS preload noise that you can get uh, sometimes. Um, I think it's the auto, no, it's the forward collision detection, isn't it, that it happens with on the original version. Um, driving through London, I didn't manage to set it off. Now, whether they've changed the parameters for it as to whether it reacts differently I don't know but I didn't notice any priming of brakes and things like that but again only drove it for three and a half hours not two and a half years like some people have done so you know I, I suspect for most people they hear the noise infrequently under certain circumstances and it's not a daily occurrence but therefore it's, it's hard for us to test on a test drive. There's an impossible question come in for uh, I suspect Miles and Pat which is almost like asking which is your favourite child, uh, and they're asking what's the ride, which rides better, the MG5 or the new ZS? Yeah, that silence. MG5. <laughs> MG5, you think, Pat? MG5 is a lower car, so I can see how it does handle better in most circumstances because it's got a lower centre of gravity. Um, it does feel slightly sportier. Having said that, I actually quite like the new ZS because I quite like the seating position being that slightly higher. Um, and um, yeah, I, I thought that the ZS was, was great to be honest. So, I mean, if I've, I've had an MG5 now for, a, well, since they came out, uh, when the new ZS comes out, I'll be switching to the new ZS, um, I hope, uh, as long as I've got free stock. Um, so, so yeah, so that's what um, I'd probably go for the ZS. I, I, I like the range of it, obviously, you know, I think the bigger range is good. Um, I think that, you know, I quite like the higher up driving position, but it does depend on the type of roads that you typically drive on. Um, London's mental. So I, in London, I was... Um, we were in, I'll have to make an apology for that. <laughs> we, were, we were in nose of tail traffic in London, and a guy came past us in the most suitable vehicle he could possibly think to drive around central London, which was uh, a 1985 Ferrari 328 Air GTS. And I was like... That, uh, that car had a really heavy clutch when it was brand new. And to do stop start traffic in a manual uh, Ferrari, <laughs> it just staggeringly um, uh, committed to driving a classic. I think that's, that's the thing. I, I would uh, definitely think that was, and as we've seen on uh, seen before, definitely a candidate for getting it swapped to a Tesla drivetrain. I think if you're going to use it in central London, I think, you know. Why not get more power and a lot easier to drive and just stick a Tesla motor in there? Because um, it was uh, it was so ridiculously low as well. I think that's probably one of the things just noticed from the ZS a bit higher up. Um, the roof line of this Ferrari was the same as the uh, wheel arches on the uh, white vans that were driving for Amazon around London. So it was really it, it was really looked like it was sat in a pit. Um, I just, I, I, Rather you than me, mate. I, I, I think I said before on the Facebook group, and I'd say it again today. Driving in London is a bit like childbirth. Once you've done it once, you can't understand why anyone would ever think to do it again. I live thirty-one miles from London, and I rarely travel there. Tube, brilliant. Train, fantastic. Driving, no. I'd rather shoot myself in the head. I drive in once a month. Do you? What? Just, just like for for thrills. Um, I do some work in London once a month, but I have managed to be able to find free parking on a Sunday in central London. Yeah, well, Sunday I can see it's probably not as bad, but on a on a Thursday at four pm when you're yeah. trying to get back in the MGs at S because the car uh, because your train leaves at five and you need to get half an hour down to the station 
Um, it was stressful. <laughs> oh dear, we've learned a lot about Miles' uh, philosophies in life today. <laughs> Anyway, I've got two kids, so you know, obviously, I didn't learn the lesson either. So, uh, I believe you didn't have much pain in the childbirth, but uh, we'll move on. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're just about drawing to a close, guys. I'm just noticing the time that that, uh, that was really interesting. Uh, uh, one thing we must clear up, but I don't know if you've seen it, Miles, there's a thread going in the, the, the uh, forum saying, um, Miles per kilowatt hour not looking so pretty or something. It's actually somebody saying that they're only getting 95 miles and a full charge on a Yeah, it's not, it's not, a, comment on my it's not a, a comment on my attractiveness, although it's still a comment. How um, could it be? But I have noticed you're wearing white trainers on the, in your most recent video, so uh, that's... Yeah, well, so, yeah, the, the video has changed. So um, my videos have previously all been for Chorley Group, and this is my Chorley Group tie when I'm, you know, under the yeah. Chorley Group banner, but... Um, we're actually um, starting up a sort of YouTube channel for Go EV, which is the new sort of sub brand. And yeah. so, styling wise and everything, we're going to sort of be going off the red ties. So, if, if, if at the next podcast I don't have a, a tie on and I'm not, you know, looking quite as corporate, that's because basically that's the way we're taking my role within the company is that we're going to, I'm going to be let, trying to give me a bit more freedom. So, I'm not seen as. Uh, Putting the company line quite so much, I can I can say a bit. Which to be fair, I've never had a problem on this podcast saying what I probably shouldn't do anyway. But um, it just means that I've got a bit more freedom to uh, to have an opinion on things and yeah. uh, and to be a bit more uh, hopefully trusted, you know, with what I'm saying rather than people think I'm just doing it for for sales. And you know, I think everybody does appreciate your your candor on the 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 podcasts, uh, and so that's good news. That'd be great. I suppose the other one I noticed in quite a lot of uh, traffic on is the shipments of the new long range MG5. So they, they're they on the high seas and getting closer to us, aren't they? Yeah. And there's, there's boats turning up every, almost every week with more cars on. The thing is, at the moment, to give you an idea for our dealership, we've got 400 cars currently on order with MG. Um, so we have no, so, no available stock whatsoever. Every single car that we've got on order is sold already. So if every dealership's in a similar position, then there could, you know, there's 120 dealers, you know, so there could be a thousand cars turn up and it makes no difference whatsoever to what people are seeing actually, you know, because they'll all be going straight out to people that ordered them three months ago. Um, so it won't necessarily bring your order date forward at all. Um, yeah. But there, there are big plans to bring a lot more boats to the UK with a lot more stock. They are targeting... And they think they're going to be over 30,000 sales this year. Um, and they're hoping, because that's a 56% growth uh, on last year. So uh, they're actually hoping that they can sort of hit sort of 40,000 this next year as well. So obviously that's going to involve them having to get more stock across. Right. And um, but yeah, Keith, Val Keith Valance has come to see you to buy you buy one anyway. He's just uh, mentioned that. He's come to Charlie to buy his MG5. Uh, yes, he's going to buy an MG5 facelift. We'll see you in probably July then, Keith. Better put the kettle on. Great. And Miles, I, I think you mentioned it in the last podcast. The guy's driving from Manchester to Gibraltar in an MG5 to raise funny money for walking with the wounded. Yes. yes. Yeah. So uh, last Monday, they set off from Manchester and drove down to Gibraltar. Uh, took them two days to get there, pretty much, 48 hours, 47 hours, something like that. They stopped, um, I think, 16 times en route um, over the 1,800, is it 1,800 miles? Um, part of the reason for stopping so often was because they just didn't trust the, you know, plug share and zap maps and everything else when it says that there's a charger there. And with good reason, because one time, well, a couple of times they'd stop where it said there was a charger and they found out it was in the opposite carriageway and there was no bridge to get there. Uh, and the nearest yeah. route was 30 miles detour. So mm -hmm. they didn't ever run down to, they didn't run it below sort of 20% if they could help it. Um, so they were stopping a lot more often than they would have done obviously otherwise. Um, but they, um, yeah, they did it. They got down to Gibraltar. They laid a wreath on, um, down at, uh, at the uh, police headquarters down there for uh, the Remembrance Day. 
and then they uh, set off back on Saturday and they got back there to Manchester this morning. Um, so they only had one charger that failed to charge, but there was a, fortunately there was one uh, five miles away. Um, so they managed to get to that okay. But uh, yeah, no, so they've uh, did the full journey. I think it was, yeah, 3,400 miles in total they did. No problems mm. with any, the battery overheating or anything like that. You know, they were driving constantly. They were they just swapping drivers. They weren't stopping to let the car cool down or anything. Um, and yeah, so overall, they've, they've done really, really well. That was an MG5 long range. Yeah. Uh, they were raising money for um, walking with the wounded. Um, yeah. I think they've raised about two and a half, in, in excess of two and a half grand already. So they have, well, um, guys. They, they were hoping the target is £10,000. So if anyone would like to donate, um, the details are on the forum. And if you can, uh, yeah, if you can spare, you know, ten pounds or whatever, to, or more to uh, to donate, it's a very worthy cause, and certainly the guys have put in the the effort in getting there and back. Yeah, absolutely brilliant, and I take my hat off to them. And and even as a tight fist of Scotsman, Miles, I've done the decent thing there. I've done it. Very good. Thing. <laughs> Right, so we'll wrap up there, uh, everybody, if that's okay. So just before we go, there's a few things that we cover every week. Uh, if you'd like to support us, please consider uh, the MG Forum's Premier Membership. It's only £3 a month, and that gives you a Premier Membership badge, the ability to upload the profile banner, the ability to select the MG Red theme, and a discount code for MG EV merchandise. You get a full 10% discount when you use the code that's available uh, on the Premier site. Uh, and the knowledge that, of course, you are helping us to bring you this podcast and indeed bring you the whole forum. Please have a look at the merchandise, check it out. Uh, and there's a link on the forum men menu and there's some of the products. Still waiting for the polo shirt to arrive. Uh, as soon as there's polo shirt, uh, an old git like me will happily buy, buy that. I noticed during the podcast some folk have uh, subscribed. Thank you very much for doing that. Please keep subscribing. It is important to us. So without further ado, if I could just bounce around and say thanks very much for your contributions tonight. Matthew, thanks, thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Steve, Steve Green, thanks again. Good night, all. Pat, it was great hearing from you again, and, and thank you. And if we can continue to tap into your uh, experience and, and knowledge, that would be great. My pleasure. And, of course, from the Charlie Group, Miles Roberts. Miles, thanks very much for your input again. Thanks, all. So we'll be back with another MG EV podcast soon. Please click all the likes and subscribe. We do, really do appreciate that. And, again, please. Thank, thanks and good night to everybody and thanks for watching. We'll be back soon. Thank you. Goodbye.